Welcome everyone to this special webinar, Envisioning a Healthier and More Equitable Society Post-Pandemic. I am Jameson Roth, Vice President of the School of Public Health Alumni Network and a graduate of the Family Science Bachelor's Degree Program. This event was organized by the University of Maryland Alumni Association in partnership with the School of Public Health and is open to all UMD alumni and friends. The University of Maryland Alumni Association is dedicated to providing and partnering on virtual programs similar to today's experience. We hope that you will continue to connect with us in this new virtual world. Be sure to sign up and join us for morning workouts, fun trivia, panel discussions, and webinars. Please check out our new blog, which features tips from TERPs, alumni spotlights, and everything UMD. You can find all these resources by visiting our website at alumni.umd.edu. We encourage you to support your alumni association by joining today. Your membership supports diverse programs and events curated just for our alumni community. Today's conversation will be moderated by School of Public Health Dean Boris Lushniak, who will introduce three public health faculty experts who will give brief presentations that will be followed by a question and answer session. We encourage you to send your questions via the chat, and you can also have the option when we get to the Q&A section to use the raise your hand function and be called on to ask your question on camera. And now, a brief introduction of our fearless dean. Dean Lushniak leads the School of Public Health, which is the university's youngest and most racially and ethnically diverse academic college. As dean since 2017, he has developed several new academic programs to meet workforce needs, launched a global health initiative, and provided leadership in the context of the global coronavirus pandemic and the groundswell against racism and injustice. Dr. Lushniak is a retired United States Public Health Service Commission Corps Rear Admiral. His 27-year service in the USPHS cum cumulated in roles as U.S. Deputy Surgeon General from 2010 to 2015 and Acting Surgeon General from 2013 to 2014. His stature as a globally recognized leader advocating for protecting, promoting, and advancing the health and safety of our nation is a great asset to the University of Maryland School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Lushniak. Thanks so much, Jameson, and thank you to the Alumni Association for hosting uh, this event here today. Now, think about the world as it exists right now. And I think today's topic, envisioning a healthier and more equitable society, is critical, right? We can talk all about what's currently taking place, and certainly there are webinars filled with that. What we're trying to achieve today as part of this University of Maryland Do Good World is, is looking at the idea of vision, envisioning, right? That, that's an important concept where we're projecting ahead and saying, based upon all the things that have been going on, where are we heading? What are the options that exist out there? What are the decision points that need to be made? So first and foremost, thank you for doing this already, right? You're doing something by being an attendee here. I'm gonna ask you to be an interactive attendee. When it time comes time for the Q's and A's, either through chat or through the hand raising, please get involved in, in, in a discussion and perhaps even your own opinions on this. I'm gonna put some parameters out there. Oftentimes when we talk about public health, we talk about politics, right? The issues of policies. We deal with population health, decisions being made for large segments of our population or in conjunction with large segments of our population. What we're gonna to try to avoid here today is gonna to be the partisan politics that envelops our world. Yes, we're getting ready for a presidential election, that's critical. Make sure you all are registered to vote, point number one. But let's try to keep partisan politics out of today's discussion as much as possible. I'm gonna provide a brief overview of where we're at with the coronavirus pandemic because that's the prelude of what part of what's going on. Here in Maryland, we've had an average of 896 cases per day over the past week, that's an increase of 22% from the average two weeks earlier, which means what? We're not necessarily heading in the right direction. As of this morning, we've had at least 91,000 plus cases and 3,523 deaths in Maryland. Case numbers are surging throughout most of the United States, including in many states that were among the first to reopen. I, I must stress for all of you, we must remain vigilant, right? And it's it's all about the public health messaging that you can get in. Wear your masks, avoid closed spaces, 
avoid crowds, avoid close contact with individuals. We need to work together to get this under control. While we are still very much mired in the coronavirus pandemic and the infection rates are spiking in many states, this webinar gives us the opportunity to think beyond, as I mentioned earlier, the current moment and envision the future. We have a new president at the University of Maryland. And as President Daryl Pines has recently said, we're in the midst of actually twin pandemics, not just COVID-19, but the violence against black lives rooted in our country's legacy of institutionalized racism. While the racism and the discrimination is not new, it has been brought to widespread consciousness by the Black Lives Matter movement, which has broader participation than ever before after the killing of George Floyd shook the nation. We're at a pivot point with the potential to influence great change. We're here today to consider what opportunities the pandemic and this groundswell against racial injustice and the election year provide to rethink and reshape how we live and how we support the most vulnerable amongst us. What role does public health play in moving forward? Those of us in public health are optimistic by nature. While there are many challenges that lie ahead, we want to think strategically about how public health can lead the way to influence change that will promote health and advance equity. Today we have three esteemed faculty members from the School of Public Health are going to be presenting today. This includes Dr. Jennifer Roberts, the Assistant Professor of Kinesiology, Dr. Natalie Slopin, an Assistant Professor of Epidemiology, and Dr. Dylan Roby, Associate Professor and Associate Chair of Health Policy and Management. I'll give you their brief CV, uh, bios right now. Then we'll go into all three presentations, and then we'll come back with some questions and answers. So Dr. Jennifer Roberts, you're her research focuses on the relationship between the built environment and physical activity, in addition to its impact on obesity and other public health outcomes. She directs the public health outcomes and effects of the built environment laboratory. She's currently a Harvard environment, JPB environmental health fellow, and is part of a cohort of leading young scholars whose research is focused on vulnerable communities and are interested in how both environmental and social factors may combine to influence health. She'll so talk about health determinants patterned by race and place. Dr. Natalie Slopin's research focuses on what? On social influences on health, health disparities, psychological and biological mechanisms through which childhood experiences are embedded to increase risk for later chronic diseases. She recently sat on an expert National Academies panel that produced the report Vibrant and Healthy Kids, Aligning Science, Practice, and Policy to Advance Health Equity. This report applies findings from the latest neurobiologic and socio-behavioral research to inform programs and policies to support the healthy development of all U.S. children and mitigate the impacts of adverse experiences. She'll talk about childhood adversity and the COVID-19 pandemic. And then to complete this triad, Dr. Dylan Roby's research focuses on Medicaid, community health centers, safety net hospitals, delivery system change, and the Affordable Care Act's implications for insurance markets, system redesign, and access to care. He's conducted multiple evaluations of state efforts to redesign healthcare delivery and payment systems. Dr. Roby collaborates with colleagues at UC Berkeley, UCLA on the California simulation of insurance markets, the micro simulation model, which he helped develop over the past decade. And he's a member of the cost analysis team for the California Health Benefit Review Program. He'll talk about envisioning a healthier, more equitable healthcare financing system. And so without further uh, Talk from me. Uh, let's begin with uh, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Roberts' uh, presentation. Jennifer, if you will. Jennifer, you're on mute. Thank you. I always do that. <laughs> um, I was saying thank you again for the introduction. And um, it is a pleasure to be with all of you today virtually. Um, and I don't see the slides. Okay, great. So today, actually, I wanna open a discussion um, to talk about some of the health and equity issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. 
So since April, the news media has really been filled with um, headlines that reveal a startling race and ethnic-based disparity of COVID-19 cases and deaths. As a country, we initially kind of dropped the ball with our COVID-19 surveillance because race and ethnicity data were not co reported or collected. Um, and unfortunately, the severity of these disparities remained undetected and underreported until about April. And then by then, we were seeing that there were states like Louisiana, Illinois, Michigan that were reporting COVID-19 uh, mortality rates of Black residents that were two and nearly three times that of the actual Black populations in those states. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, actually, okay. Um, and so actually, I want you to um, look at this figure. It, it's, it's kind of condensed, but I want you to look at it in three parts. The brown on the bottom, the green to the left, and the yellow to the right. So starting with the brown section, most often when we um, think about things that drive our health, we think about the determinants or the traits that we were born with. So like our genetic predisposition or the generational influences for certain health outcomes and behaviors. Um, and which leads us to the yellow box on the right. And so these individual determinants that we were born with can affect our health behaviors, such as like what we eat or the health outcomes, um, like obesity or diabetes, which can then in turn again affect our health behaviors. And as such, what we have seen is that certain health outcomes or pre existing illnesses have put many of us at a higher risk for severe illness um, from COVID 19. But this is not the entire story. If anyone has ever heard of the phrase, zip code is a better uh, predictor of health than genetic code, these social determinants of health that we see in the green section exemplify this expression. Everything from our built environment, so that's like the type of house we live in or the neighborhood we live in, to our food environment, so the availability of grocery stores in our communities, and to the social environment, which are the social and cultural systems that we navigate daily in our home, in our work, um, they all affect our health. And so finally, all of these silos in these social determinants of health are really put into motion by laws and policies, many of which have been stemmed from discriminatory ideologies and racism. Which brings me to the actual next slide. So this COVID-19 pandemic has brought to light what many scholars have known for some time, and that is that health determinants are patterned by place and race. Today, in many cities, we still see stark racial residential segregation patterns, and many of these segregated Black neighborhoods have fewer resources to maintain health. Next slide, please. So much of our present day disparities in health, wealth, and social mobility can be traced back to the 1930s with the U.S. governmental policies of redlining and blockbusting. Block busting. Um, neighborhoods that were considered hazardous or translated to predominantly black were redlined by lending institutions, thus denying them you know, capital investment. And so when we look at these two maps of San Diego, we could directly see a relationship between the neighborhoods that were redlined from a 1935 security map and the dark purple areas today, which indicate the number of visits to the emergency room due to asthma-related events. Also closer to home, the map on the right, it shows the same type of relationship except with life expectancy. So you have folks living in Ward 7 and 8 of DC, which is nearly 100% black, on average live about 30 years less than folks who are living in Friendship Heights. Next slide. So at one point, property really was the primary way that families built and inherited wealth in America. And the legacies of redlining have, have been linked to disparities in wealth and um, linked to disparities in wealth and health are very much well documented. So as we can see from this graph, uh, we see that the blue bars show a disparity in wealth. The median white family now holds about 10 times the wealth of the median black and Hispanic families. Furthermore, we also see with the red line that black and Hispanic families experience higher rates of chronic disease. Next slide, please. So I'm going to just pivot for one second um, and show you that um, I'm actually a member of a risk and social policy group. And this is a group that was motivated and informed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And basically, we're just collecting a three-wave panel survey on physical and mental health, risk perceptions um, in six different states. And I'm going to show you some of the preliminary information we got from the first panel with respect to essential workers. Next slide. 
Um, but before I do that, I actually want to show you first an example of how the COVID-19 has made things worse for many essential workers. So if we take a look at this, we see that Amani, a 37-year-old Black woman, is an essential worker who works as a grocery store cashier. The low-wage job of Amani's job means that she has fewer options for affordable housing and transportation. She lives in a racially segregated neighborhood with low quality housing, does not have a car. Um, Amani's neighborhood has low employment opportunities and poor transit options. She has to travel further to her job and take public transportation. And this is just an example with the blue tag showing all of the highlights of the social determinants um, that surround her and um, directly relate to her health. And then the red text just kind of highlight the points of her higher COVID exposure, risk exposure, whether that's being a cashier or taking public transportation. Next slide, please. So finally, this is just kind of going back to the panel survey, just is just showing that in our first wave, we saw that more black and Hispanic people were essential workers, which is consistent with what we've seen in other research. Next slide. And then also what we also would expect that more essential workers in comparison to non-essential workers had to work outside the home with 40% nearly working every day. And this basically just translates to a higher exposure to um, COVID. Next slide. So where do we go from here? Well, I hope today this is an opportunity that we can actually have this discussion. I put together some kind of short-term actions, such as you know widespread free testing events in vulnerable neighborhoods. Um, but most importantly, I also think we also have to think about we need to stop pathologizing communities of color and pointing to their individual choices, looking at them or insinuating that these choices, that they're unhealthy or abnormal. <clears throat> Next slide. And so some of these other longer term suggestions that I also have, such as increased preventive healthcare services and affordable housing will take much more investment, but really there is no option at this point but to do it if we're going to actually uplift marginalized communities and move forward to achieving a more healthy and equitable society. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I wanna make three main points over the course of this presentation. The first is that childhood, ex we know from um, decades of research that childhood experiences are biologically embedded in a variety of different ways that can impact opportunities for health, not only in childhood, but across the life course. The second point that I'd like to make is that the stress and uncertainty of the pandemic will increase the severity and frequency of many well-established adverse childhood experiences in unequal ways across our society, which has implications for health disparities. And the third point of my presentation um, is that it is possible to intervene. So next slide, please. So a major component of my research program focuses on the biology of stress, which shows us that prolonged or excessive activation of the stress response system in childhood can have negative, a negative influence on child development with implications for our behavior, learning, and health across the entire life course. So we have this evidence coming from a variety of different longitudinal studies that have followed children from during the childhood period into adulthood. And we know that stress and disadvantage in our social circumstances can have these lifelong consequences that we see across multiple different biological systems, beginning as early as the childhood period. Next slide, please. So uh, what I wanna emphasize today is that the stress and the uncertainty of the pandemic is going to lead to increases in the types of adversities and the frequency of adversities that we have often studied in relation to chronic health problems um, later in life. So these may include economic and social disadvantage, child abuse and neglect, food insecurity, which we know from the media is a big issue right now, as well as um, downstream influences of stress on the parent that may relate to substance abuse um, and psychopathology such as maternal depression. Um, so one specific form of, of adversity that I wanted to highlight um, right now has to do with child maltreatment because we know that many of the common risk factors for child maltreatment are um, increasing in the context of our pandemic, such as parent unemployment and financial distress and uh, parental substance misuse. 
intimate partner violence. Um, in general, levels of stress in households are very high, which is a risk factor for children. Um, so we also have to think about the fact that um, the many forms of childhood adversities, particularly those that relate to economic insecurity, are disproportionately affecting certain members of our population, including children of color and children in low-income families who are really um, suffering in the context of the pandemic. Uh, it's these same children who are suffering economically as well as most likely to have their um, parents who have to work out of the home in order to earn their income. Um, and they may also have underlying health conditions, which puts these same children at risk for having um, a parent who is sick or to lose a parent, which you know exposes them to additional um, long-term risk factors across the life course. Next slide, please. Uh, so building on Dr. Roberts' presentation, the mainstream media has provided a lot of coverage of the racial and ethnic disparities that we see for COVID infection and mortality. And so what I'm showing you on this slide is data from Maryland documenting the overrepresentation of African Americans among those afflicted with the virus. And so while some of these patterns are driven by uh, differences in social conditions in adulthood, for example, a context of employment, like we heard about in the last presentation, um, many um, of the predisposing risk factors that individuals have as adults that make COVID-19 more deadly are, are actually rooted in our childhood experiences. So um, there really is a, a need for increased attention to the scientific knowledge that we have um, about how early context shapes the risk for things like cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which put us at risk not only for um, chronic diseases, which has been studied um, in more detail, uh, but also the um, morbidity and mortality that may be related to infectious diseases such as COVID-19. Um, so um, to end, I'd like to go to my last slide. And I wanted to end on an optimistic note, uh, making the point that we can in fact intervene and we actually know a lot about what types of programs and policies can be effective um, in um, creating optimal social context for children in order to create a more equitable society. So we have quite extensive research at this point from public health, psychology, and economics, which can really um, lay out a roadmap for how we can um, minimize the negative effects of the pandemic uh, for children and families by pro providing supportive social policies that can improve their social conditions. So these interventions uh, need to take place at multiple levels, thinking about what, um, how we address the highest risk needs uh, individuals and families on a more one-to-one -one basis um, and looking towards uh, more, prox uh, more distal level social policies and practices and programs that we can put into place and improve our system so that we can better align our social policies um, with our understanding of how health inequities develop. So I wanted to um, refer you to this report that was published last summer by the National Academy of Science um, that Dr. Lushniak had mentioned during the introduction, which is titled Vibrant and Healthy Kids. And um, basically, this is a, a compendium that, it was a consensus report that thoroughly described the evidence that we have for how social policies and practices can help us to achieve a more equitable society, thinking about the youngest members of our population. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you and um, apologize for my early delay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So it's my pleasure to join you all today. Thanks to Dean Lushniak for his um, great introduction for setting the stage and also to Dr. Roberts and Dr. Slope. And I think you can see we have a very dynamic faculty um, in this relatively new school of public health and it's exciting to to go to work every day and so hopefully we can return to that normal uh, soon. So I wanted to talk a bit about our healthcare financing system more on the um, hospital and healthcare delivery side of things um, and uh, you know my work has focused throughout my career on health reform and kind of making sure that people have access to health insurance coverage um, post Affordable Care Act, a lot more people have access to affordable health insurance coverage. There's still some gaps there, but I think what 
the COVID-19 pandemic has um, exacerbated are these issues around financing and payment and the use of services and how that is linked to our healthcare system. So we can move to the next slide. So first I wanted to touch a bit on um, healthcare spending and utilization. So these are some early findings from various researchers um, and consulting firms around how much we are spending on healthcare post pandemic or during the pandemic, as well as how much we're using healthcare. Um, so many of you know, the, the level of outpatient care and the volume of outpatient care, so going to the doctor's office, but also getting ambulatory surgeries, other elective outpatient procedures has declined quite substantially since March when um, the pandemic really became to, really started to force shelter in place orders and other decisions by state governments to delay or suspend elective uh, procedures and other services. And we saw this shift of physician offices that could moving to a telehealth model um, and getting reimbursed for that uh, telehealth service through existing policies that may not have reimbursed for telehealth in the past. However, um, outpatient care in person uh, really dried up in terms of the level of use. And so there have been several studies popping up uh, recently showing that preventive service use, elective procedures, um, care for symptomatic but non-flu related illnesses has gone down quite a bit. Um, on the preventive side, it's quite shocking where some of the appropriate cancer screenings have reduced 85 to 90% since last year at this time. Um, elective procedures are down close to 60%. So there has been this contraction in the volume of care that actual healthcare providers are delivering, even with the addition of the flexibility of telehealth to make sure that patients feel safe obtaining certain types of care. Um, and so there are varying estimates where outpatient care probably has decreased between 40 and 67%, but it's targeted in certain areas. Um, the other area that's also down, which um, some may not have thought is an emergency and inpatient care. So despite the fact that COVID-19 is a fairly expensive disease to treat once you're hospitalized, you have ventilator days, you potentially have really long hospital stays and other complications, um, pneumonia, et cetera, but inpatient care and emergency services are down overall for all causes over that same period of time. So there's a mix of, um, you know, the state policies and individual attitudes around elective procedures, where some states have banned elective procedures or limited them. So that meant that physicians and the hospitals that they work with are not billing for those elective procedures because uh, the COVID-19 cases have priority and are, um, you know, it's kind of an all hands on deck approach, but uh, actual revenues are down because the only folks getting care are either really significant emergencies um, that were life-threatening and uh, COVID-19 cases. Um, we've also seen some evidence out of New York and other states around foregone emergency care. So we've seen all-cause mortality go up around heart attacks because you have people delaying care and foregoing that care, potentially resulting in morbidity or mortality um, around non-COVID-related illnesses. So that's concerning as well. Regardless, like the actual number of services being delivered in all settings has gone down quite substantially, save for telehealth, which has not replaced the volume of in-person services that um, usually are delivered in a given year and over this time period. So healthcare spending has gone down for that reason. Another reason um, is because the economic downturn has resulted in substantial loss of employment. So people who are now unemployed might be losing their employer-based coverage. They're no longer able to afford health insurance through the health insurance exchanges or through the private market. In some cases, in states that expanded Medicaid, um, they may qualify for Medicaid coverage. However, the um, Medicaid carriers and the state Medicaid agencies are not seeing as much volume as they used to, and Medicaid pays less money than private uh, insurance companies typically and Medicare. So even though um, some folks gained a new source of insurance due to the pandemic in the form of Medicaid, the actual payments going out the do door are still lower. So overall spending is uh, quite a bit down and you can move to the next slide. And this is a, um, 
simulation of, from Milliman, which is an actuarial firm and consulting group um, that has modeled um, several different options in terms of, of what the pandemic will look like in the first two quarters of 2020 and what it's expected to generate in terms of healthcare spending uh, by the end of 2020. So you can see that um, this is based on data coming out in uh, quarter one of 2020 on what happened to um, healthcare utilization and spending in that first quarter. And you can see it decreased a bit. Um, and then in, quor in quarter two, you see a wide variety of estimates because they're trying to model uh, what would happen under different scenarios. But regardless, they end up with quite substantial losses of revenue and spending in the healthcare system. And then if assumptions relate to business picking back up, you know, shelter in place orders uh, getting canceled, people returning to a, you know, post pandemic yet not completely normal way of life. They model a certain level of increase, but if we keep seeing continued hotspots and increases in COVID cases throughout the country, as potentially we're seeing now, they modeled a much lower rate of um, healthcare spending. And you can see that the range is between um, about $75 billion and uh, almost $600 billion in spending reduction by the end of 2020, which is substantial. So if you think about our healthcare system as a whole, we spend about $3.6 trillion on healthcare each year. That's about 18% of our gross domestic product. This represents um, up to a 25% decrease in medical expenditures. So a lot of people have been complaining about how much we spend on healthcare. Um, and this is an example of what happens when you spend less on healthcare, where it means fewer people are using services and those people who are using services are using far fewer and they may be delaying or foregoing needed care as well, despite the fact that there are these high cost visits related to COVID. And to give you some context, it's forecasted that we'll lose about 10% of our GDP this year because of the pandemic. Um, healthcare spending is likely to decrease a lot more than that. So it's disproportionate to the decrease in GDP. So I think for the first time in a long time, we'll probably see a lower percentage of our gross domestic product as a function of healthcare than we have in the past. We'll go on to the next slide. So this, of course, raises concerns. And I bring this up in this, in this context because we have a system that is primarily based on hospitals and providers being paid per the service they deliver. And so the revenues they're seeing and the healthcare spending in our system is largely based upon the volume of visits and admissions that a physician uh, provides or a hospital provides. So the COVID pandemic exposes problems with that approach, and that's kind of why I wanted to talk about this today, in that this instability in hospital systems as well as in the provider community at the same time a pandemic is breaking out where there are increased needs on those same hospitals and providers uh, represents a very difficult situation. And so because of that instability, um, there have to be policy options to, to address them. So one of them, of course, was to expand the use of telehealth, allow more reimbursement for telehealth, and that was a temporary fix. Um, already states have kind of started rolling, and insurers have started rolling back those relaxed requirements. Um, at the same time, you have insurance companies, these third-party insurance companies that are contracted by governments and by employers who are actually now underspending what they thought they would spend in 2020. So the premium that they set uh, for healthcare expense or for healthcare expenses in 2019, are now um, the receipts are actually coming in much lower, and so we've seen that um, in 2020, the insurers think they are actually going to spend a lot less than they thought they would in 2020. So they're probably going to, under federal law, have to refund some of that back because there's between an 80 and 85 percent ratio that they have to spend according to federal law on medical costs over premiums. So a lot of folks will probably get rebate checks from their health insurance company or the employer will get a rebate check from the health insurance company to make up for that gap. Um, however, insurers are now coming out with rates for 2021 and insurance companies don't necessarily want to assume that we will see the same decrease in spending in 2021 as we did in 2020. It's possible that the pandemic could go on it's also possible that the pandemic could be addressed 
by very expensive uh, services, procedures, and drugs in the first quarter of 2021, and they need to be able to weather that storm. So you won't see many states where insurance premiums are going down, but they are growing at a manageable rate because the insurance companies are trying to provide some level of cushion. Even though they gained a bunch of money in uh, 2020, they're worried about losing a bunch of money in 2021 because of the uncertainty. Um, so you've seen states come out with, today California's uh, health insurance exchange announced the average rate of premium increase would be 0.6%, which is on the low end. In other states, we've seen like a 5 to 6% increase, which is manageable, but still at odds with this idea that we have gone through a year where people are not using health care, and they probably have not gotten what they've paid for in terms of health insurance premiums. But the uncertainty in 2021 means that may happen again, and there's a lot of uh, inability to predict what will happen. At the same time, insurance companies are doing pretty well. Hospitals and practices are in this precarious financial situation. And because many of them are based on a volume-based system of getting paid for each service they deliver, and they aren't delivering as many services, um, the federal government has had to step in and potentially bail out practices or at least subsidize practices, uh, both through the CARES Act as well as Medicare's Accelerated Advanced Payment Program. So the CARES Act included $175 billion that went to hospitals based on 2018 Medicare revenues. So there are about $50 billion allocated for hospitals, and each hospital would get a subsidy from the federal government that did not have to be paid back based on how much Medicare business they did in 2018, and the formula was basically executed and delivered. Um, that was in April. In June, there was a little bit of money able to be allocated for Medicaid providers. So if you were a hospital that did not provide, did not get a, um, an expenditure or a an amount from the recovery fund in uh, due to your Medicare revenue, you potentially could get one due to your Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program revenue. There's also allocations in the CARES Act for rural hospitals, for skilled nursing facilities, and other providers that needed help to stay afloat. And it wasn't that they were only COVID um, hotspots, it was that there were many cases in which they would not be able to stay open without the fact that they would have this revenue coming in from the federal government, even though they weren't actually delivering many services, especially in places like California, where hospitals were basically only delivering absolutely needed care. They had a very low COVID impact, but um, they were losing lots of money versus what they would earn the year before. Then now they're hit with this uh, big COVID, um, uh, you know, outbreak. And now they're kind of switching gears into delivering lots of services to COVID patients. But again, those numbers are still relatively low and they're losing out on revenue that they would have gotten from a typical patient in the year, year prior. Um, with the Accelerated and Advanced Payment Program, which Medicare runs, um, probably about 25,000 providers have taken advantage of this program. It's a loan program though, it already existed, it's already in federal law, and it provides three months of advanced payment of Medicare reimbursement based on previous years of Medicare reimbursement but it's basically a loan and you have to pay it back. And certain hospitals can pay it back in a year. Other providers have to pay it back within 210 days. And if that amount comes due, um, you know, toward the end of 2020, and we haven't seen a return to business as usual, those providers will be in danger of defaulting on those advanced payments. Um, and again, you end up with this revenue problem for providers. So we have all these systems, you know, we have this patchwork of healthcare in the US, uh, that is not completely aligned around the needs of the population, especially in the case of a pandemic. So let's go to the next slide. So this is my last slide thinking through that, um, you know, even states that have reopened did not see the full return to normal volumes and revenues that they typically expect. And I think there is this opportunity um, in the policy process, as well as just at the state level and in working with health insurers for providers, health insurers, and federal and state governments to think through a better way to deliver care and pay for care using a more stable funding model. And Maryland provides a, a decent example of this with the current Maryland Global Budget Waiver, which basically proactively sets, prospectively sets a budget for hospitals in the state for the inpatient side of care. So all of the overnight stays and those facility costs of those hospitals 
are basically already built into um, the state budget and the federal budget. Um, and it enables hospitals to weather storms like this, where normally they would be uh, lacking cash flow because they are not doing enough in terms of volume. But because of the Maryland Global Budget Waiver, they have a predictable uh, level of revenue. Of course, with all these kind of bailout funds coming from the federal government, um, the state will have to figure out how to pay back the federal government for those that influx of money. But regardless, Maryland's hospital budgeting system is far more stable than any other states in the country. And I think that provides an interesting example where other states could move to more um, global budget-based models or capitated or um, kind of stable financing models for hospital systems rather than relying on the older volume-based system. Um, on the physician side, their Maryland physicians are not built completely into that global budget waiver. So they're still very sensitive to these changes in cash flow and revenue. Um, so that's one reason to bring them into that global budget waiver and ensure that there's some stable financing. But also you may see physicians more likely to negotiate with health insurance companies around a more stable, you know, per member per month or capitated budget model or shift to more performance-based revenue rather than the typical volume-based um, fee-for-service system we're in now. So I don't expect this to overnight uh, change into a policy discussion about how we're going to overhaul the healthcare system. I think the dust needs to settle first, but I think it does change the dynamics in terms of providers, um, whether on the hospital side or physician side, used to stand pretty firm and say, like, we want a fee-for-service model, we're going to negotiate contracts with hospitals based on price, and we're gonna push those prices up as much as we can, given our market share and given our, our negotiating leverage. And now the rug has been pulled out from under them. And so I think there is a time for kind of re-envisioning how our healthcare system financing, finances hospital and physician care. So I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks very much. Great, thank you to all three uh, presenters. Uh, and I am starting to get a series of questions that are coming in right now. Uh, on our chat. And let me start with uh, actually for our first two panelists, uh, so Jen and Natalie. Uh, you know, the question that's presented here is for people not in public health, people in our community, how can they best advocate for better policies in their workplaces or their communities uh, uh, from, from your perspectives and your, your expertise? How does advocacy play a role in this, Jen? Um. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think advoc advocacy can come at many different levels. Um, it could even be something, you know, at a very small level, um, kind of like the last figure that um, Dr. Slocan had put up that looked at the different levels from the individual to the policy level. Um, advocacy could just be, you know, something in your own individual type of setting, your own household, you know, in terms of things that you encourage, you know, encourage wearing masks, encourage social distancing. You could have it all the way up to more of a, you know, a community level where maybe you're advocating to initiate, you know, free testing in certain neighborhoods that you know do not have that free testing or um, distribution of masks. So I think advocacy can come in many different varieties, in many different forms and at many different levels. And it's something that I think collectively, if we do a little bit at a time, we can really make a big, a big change. Great. Natalie? Your perspective on advocacy and the role in your line sure. of work. So I would say that we, as um, researchers and in the research community, we really need to remember that our data will not speak for themselves. And, um, you know, m the public by and large does not have a grasp on the extent to which we have health disparities in this country, as well as a, a thorough understanding of the profound differences that we have in um, economic security across racial and ethnic groups. So we have these vast differences that are under-recognized. And so I think that, um, you know, as scientists who care about um, achieving greater equity, we, we cannot only work on the science anymore, but we have to figure out better ways to communicate with the public and with the media to ensure that the messages get out in a way that's digestible and, and can lead communities to feel empowered to, um, to work towards changes and greater, you know, collaborations um, between different sectors to, to create the communities that we need to allow everyone to thrive. Great, thank you. Dylan, this one's for you. <clears throat> and especially looking at <clears throat> Medicare or Medicaid policies, 
and specifically the allocation of more dollars to areas with greater need or where disparities are more, more evident. Uh, is there a way for payment for improvement of well, uh, improvement of, of, of conditions versus pay for level of quality? How do we get there? What is sort of the future in terms of uh, I mean, areas I of greater need? I think it's certainly tough. So for example, the way the CARES Act allocated dollars for hospitals and providers um, of that 175 billion was completely formulaic and based. There was a section of the fund that was available for places that had high COVID impact and everything else was based on a formula based on previous revenues. So you're not um, incentivizing payers that are, you know, providers that were higher quality. I think that does speak to the kind of reactionary um, way we do health policy in the country where we're not thinking in a forward way about what incentives do we need to set up in order to ensure health equity. So paying based on population health, paying based on reducing health disparities. We tend to do it with um, either these stopgap approaches just to solve a crisis, or we do it with broader performance incentives, but we often don't have that um, disparities or equity angle. So for example, in MACRA, the Medicare, and, uh, Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, it changed the way physicians got paid in the US back in 2019-18. Um, and it used quality metrics, but it didn't use quality met metrics based on how certain populations were performing. It didn't use quality metrics around uh, reducing disparities within your patient population. It's just a broad brush type of approach. So I do think there's a way of kind of envisioning um, how you can include more equity-based information. One attempt has been in risk adjustment. So um, there has been a group, uh, I think it was through the Kellogg Foundation, National Association of Community Health Centers, a group of community health centers in Oregon that were trying to figure out, okay, how do we uh, do risk adjustment, taking racial ethnic disparities into consideration, and then using that to allocate payment. And so I think there are some efforts out there, but it, you know, as Natalie mentioned, if that approach works, then you need to translate it and make sure that federal policymakers are paying attention and it's a priority to actually address. And I think a lot of the COVID has shown how poor health outcomes and poor access has been exacerbated in underrepresented minority communities, but the policy effort is so thrown together at this point because it's a huge emergency that there's not a lot of thoughtful thinking around, oh, how should we incentivize behavior now? It's really, let's try to fix this problem with a bunch of money. And so I think it's not a discussion that can happen now. It's a discussion that'll happen later looking back on how this actually harmed, you know, underrepresented communities and how we need to fix the problem going forward. Great. I do want to mention to everyone who's on uh, that Kelly Blake just posted on the chat site the uh, uh, presentation slides or the, the drive where the presentation slides are available. So if you want to copy that link to everybody who's on. A uh, question really dealing that that's been submitted on the chat uh, site is, is the issue of, of stress, mental health, uh, and uh, sort of the effect on, you know, what can individuals, families, healthcare professionals, you know, uh, how do we deal with the me mental and psychological trauma of the pandemic, the shelter in place order, and, and what should we be looking at? Jen or, uh, uh, or Natalie? I, I think, um, I mean, that's, that's a really an excellent question. It can be answered in so many different ways. I think um, dealing with the stress of it, I think even just going to some of the basics in terms of, you know, um, regular exercise, having some moments in green space. I think that all this is very helpful to kind of get away from all of the stressors that are in the built environment and it's constant reminders um, of what is going on. Um, also, giving yourself breaks from looking at the news and, and seeing all of the numbers. Um, like almost to the point where like I will wake up and I'll say, okay, what are the numbers for Maryland and this? And then that's it. I close it. There's no more, you know, because it can really be daunting. Um, and then checking in with your friends and family um, and knowing that, you know, if things are going on that are a little bit more, um, a little bit more, more than what friends and family can help you with, knowing that there's 
um, outlets in terms of, you know, mental health um, resources where you can go and you can actually get help if you feel like you're really, really struggling with this issue. Great. Anything from your perspective, Natalie, on this? I liked everything that Dr. Robert said. Uh, the first things that came to my mind was, you know, taking steps to try to have time outdoors in green space. We know from research that that's healing and can be really good for mental health, especially in a time like this. For children, they can also get physical activity, which is really important for maintaining both physical and mental health as well. So outdoor time, I think, um, you know, doing everything that parents can to reassure their children and maintain that warm and responsive relationship in the midst of all of this uncertainty is um, really what children need and not necessarily easy. And then I would also say that um, efforts to keep up communications however we can, it may not work for really young children. I have a five-year-old who does, is not comforted talking to a friend on Zoom, whereas my seven-year-old really, you know, um, I do feel as though efforts to maintain those relationships with his peers or teachers has um, been really effective. So I think we have to think developmentally about what works for whom. And I think for adults, um, working towards efforts that can help ensure that all members of one's community um, are doing as well as possible can be really helpful as well. So volunteerism related to um, helping communities maintain food security or working with schools to um, ensure that all members of the school are doing as well as possible. Those sorts of endeavors can create a sense of community and help uh, get us through this time. Great. Well, thank you, Natalie. We are at the time period where we should be wrapping up, and I'll do so very expeditiously here. First of all, thanking everybody who was involved in putting this webinar together uh, and everybody who attended, and especially to our esteemed presenters. Uh, that being said, you know, we're, we're sort of just touching, obviously, the tip of the iceberg, not only in describing the problems, but also the envisioning of where we could be. I always uh, tell our students and our faculty and staff at the School of we in public health have to be optimists, right? The pessimists wash out early in your careers, whether as a student. Uh, and so we have to look at the world that although, you know, is a changing and there's many uh, potential uh, issues that we have to deal with and current issues we have to deal with. We didn't even mention one of the uh, participants uh, mentioned, you know, you didn't say anything about climate change as yet another pandemic, right? And, and that's certainly a biggie that we throw into the idea of major crises. And yet with our optimism is the sense is with discussion, with policy, yes, with politics, there are options, right, that are out there in front of us to be able to change the world. And we need to do so, not just as public health people, but as a community. Uh, and, and so I thank you all for being part of this uh, webinar. And uh, once again, let's change the world, right? We at the University of Maryland, we're a do-good campus. And so let's do good even in the midst of all this that is being thrown at us. Thank you so much for everybody and uh, for everybody's attendance. And first of all, stay healthy, really important. All the best.